Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the RX Radio webinar with RX Radio reporters and Professor Glenda Gray. This event is brought to you by RX Radio, and we're partnered with the Citizens in Solidarity Behavioral Change Campaign because we want to make a contribution to the crisis that our country is currently facing and dealing with. My name is Alex, and I'm the moderator for today's discussion. I'm an RX Radio reporter, and currently I've got a show called RX Radio Breakfast, which broadcasts on the weekend, and it's a special show that we've been doing during the lockdown that I've been broadcasting from, uh, from home. And one of the things we've been doing on the show, and with the station in general, with RX Radio in general, has been to keep people informed with regards to COVID-19. And today we're going to be continuing to do that um, by uh, expressing the voice, uh, expressing the voices of children and their questions, and these questions that we're going to be using today have all been put together by RX Radio young reporters, and they're going to be asked by RX Radio reporters. And some of them have been put together by reporters that aren't here, um, so we've included as many reporters as possible. And these questions are going to be asked to Professor Glenda Gray. And Professor Glenda Gray is a mother and a pediatrician by practice. Additionally, she is the first female president and CEO of the South African Medical Research Council. Forbes named the professor one of Africa's 50 most powerful women, and Time named her as one of the world's 100 most influential people. In 2013, she was awarded South Africa's highest honor, the Order of Mapungubwe. And currently, she's the chair of the Research Committee on COVID-19, which brings together scientific evidence and experience to the Minister of Health and the National Coronavirus Command Council. It's a privilege to have her with us today, and we're excited as a group to learn more about the pandemic and current situation that we find ourselves in. Professor, thank you so much for joining us, and welcome to the webinar. In the preparation for this and in the build-up, uh, obviously we've been researching some of the interviews that you have done, and definitely something that sets this apart is that you're going to be interviewed by children today. So welcome to the webinar. In case I left anything out, could you please introduce yourself and what is it like being with us this morning? So good morning, everybody. Um, usually I'm from Cape Town, but I happen to be in Johannesburg this weekend. I'm visiting my family. That's the first time now that we've all traveled. We're in a level, level two lockdown. It's wonderful to be here as a pediatrician and as a mother. And I hope that I can um, answer some of your questions and help you navigate uh, this pandemic um, children. Well, Professor, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and if anyone wants to join us and the discussion, they can do so on social media and find Rx Radio SA on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and also use the hashtags that we've got for this event, which is hashtag children's voices, hashtag Rx Radio, and hashtag solidarity. Now, to get a better understanding of who's going to be involved in today's discussion, we're now going to go around the uh, virtual table and have each reporter introduce themselves, starting with Nuru. Hello, Professor. I, hello, Professor Gray. My, I am Nuru Nisha Pinar. I am nine years old. I am an RX Radio young reporter. I do not have any condition. I was born when my sister was diagnosed with leukemia. I supported supporting her with with my feature feature in her show Kukamina's movies and series. Thanks, Nuru. Um, uh, Yusra. Hi, Professor. I. I am Yusra. I am sister to Nasira over here. We co-host a show called Books and Breakfast with Yusra and Nasira. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thanks, Yusra. Amina? Hello, Professor. My name is Amina Pinar. I am 13 years old and I go to Nuclear Primary School. I was diagnosed with leukemia at the age of three when my sister was born, my little sister named Nisha, as she said. I am a RX Radio Child Young Reporter. I have my own show called Agnes Movies and Series, featuring my sister, as she said, on the popular playlist. Thank you for having us today. I hope you're doing good. Thanks so much. Uh, Malika? 
Dear professor, my name is Malika Swale. I'm 17 years old. I attend Alsis Nova High School and I've been working with Western Cape Student Commissioner Christina Nomdu following my link that I've written to the president regarding the return to schools. So I'm sorry, I, I, I lost my bandwidth. So maybe can we start over from the first question? I missed the first question because my bandwidth, my bandwidth uh, uh, was uh, not good. So can we start over, guys? I'm sorry. Uh, Professor, we haven't started with questions yet. Everyone's just introducing themselves. So we just... <laughs> Sorry, I just something happened to my bandwidth. Okay, cool. You sound much better now. We've got you. Cool. Um, thanks, Malika. And then Usama. Hi, Professor. I'm Usama. I'm 12 years old and I'm an RFK reporter. I do not have a show yet, but I am part of the new scheme. And I was, when I was born, I was diagnosed with asthma and sinus. And then one oh. day my asthma and sinus started acting up very bad. So I, my, my mommy took me to the doctor. Then I was referred to Red Cross and I was discharged last year. Thanks so much, Osama. Uh, Sonwabo. Um, good morning, Professor. My name is Sonwabo and I'm 13 years old. Um, I had a problem with my knee, so I went to the doctor at Red Cross and she told me that I had a um, flat feet condition. And so uh, from, the, from there on, I started going to our children. Thanks, Sonwabo. Tariq? Hi, Professor. My name is Tariq Kenny. I'm 19 years old. Um, at the age of three, I was diagnosed with a rare chronic illness called cystinosis. And then in 2015, I received a kidney transplant. And as everyone else, I'm a young reporter on RX Radio and I host a show called Completely Random. Thanks, Tariq. Amira? Hi, Professor. My name is Amira Pinar. I am 18 years old. I am the oldest sister of Nurunisa and Tamina. Tamina was diagnosed with leukemia when she was three. It was also the year Nurunisa was born. I also have a show on Oryx Radio called Amira's Hot Playlist. Blessed. I think you, oh, there we go. Blessed's on. Hi, my name is Blessed. I'm 13 years old. I don't know, always when I was not diagnosed anemia, and I made it to be with RX radio. Okay, cool. Thank you. Blessed. Nasira. Hello, Professor. I am Nasira. I am 11 years old. I am in Boston Primary School. And my sister and I, Yisra, we have a show together for Books and Breakfast with Yisra and Nasira. My condition is CMP, which shows the child community. Thanks so much, Nasira. And then lastly, Talita. Good morning, Professor. My name is Talita Counter. I'm 16 years old. I'm a Red Cross patient and an RX radio reporter. Six weeks after I was born, I was diagnosed with a condition called meningoencephalitis. And that was when a viral infection happened in the brain that caused my muscles not to function properly. I also have a tracheostomy, a tube in my airway that helps me cough up my phlegm because my muscles are too weak to do it for themselves. I'm also part of a show at RX Radio called Zara's Kitchen where I help her with the show. Also I have a feature in that show where I play three of my favorite songs and speak more about them. Right, uh, thanks to all the reporters and the professors also with us again. I think the internet's got sorted out. So we're now going to begin with our questions. There are a total of 20. Um, I'll be reading out the numbers so that we can all stay on track. And we wanted to start by getting a better idea of the coronavirus itself as to why it makes us sick and what the processes are when you test positive. So to start us off with our first question, we have Nuru. How and why does the coronavirus make you sick? And is it true that children do not have do not become very sick with this virus? And that many people that are positive do not have any symptoms at all. So Nuru is talking very softly. 
And um, I'm going to ask you to come closer because I don't think anyone heard, you, heard what you were saying. So I'm going to ask you to come closer because I do want the YouTube people to hear what you're asking because you're asking a very important question. How and why does the coronavirus make you sick? And is it true that children do not become very sick with this virus? And that many people that are positive do not have any symptoms at all? Okay, so what you're saying is a very important uh, question, is that um, coronavirus COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, uh, the virus that causes COVID-19, seems to not affect young children and um, school-going children as much as it affects adults. And so this, there may be many reasons for this. It may be that you, your immune systems are different. It also means that the virus receptors that um, the virus needs to get into the, the body, there are less of these receptors in, in little children. And also because children may have been exposed to other kinds of coronavirus before, there may be cross a reaction which may cause you to have protection. So although this virus has affected almost 27 million people in the world and almost um, 875,000 deaths, it has spared children. And it has spared children largely uh, because uh, we think that you have a different immune response and also the ACE2 receptors that you have um, are much less than we see in adults. And so this is very good, but it doesn't, sometimes when you are a child and you have chronic diseases, um, this, may, this, this, this virus may affect you um, badly, but on the whole, which is good news, is that the virus doesn't affect young children as much as it affects much older people. Um, it's also true that a lot of people do have asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic disease, um, and that's what's so strange about this, this um, virus, is that even though a lot of people will have asymptomatic disease, there are people who are old, over, over, over 55, who have what we call comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, and obesity, and, um, and who may have um, a, a, a much more worse outcome than people just who just have normal infection. And so although um, most of us will have asymptomatic disease, there are people that will have very severe disease and may even die. And so that's why it's our job to try and protect the other people from getting severe disease. And we do this by wearing masks, by keeping our distance, and by making sure that we wash our hands all the time. Thank you, Professor, for um, beginning us off and getting us into a good understanding of what COVID-19 is and why it actually does uh, make, us, make us sick. And so to continue with this theme, this introduction to COVID-19, we've got Yusra to ask a question about um, if it is possible to get reinfected. Yusra. Professor, can you please explain to us um, if you have tested positive for COVID-19, can you actually be reinfected and get sick again? Yes, sir, that's a very good question. And if you'd asked me that question three weeks ago, I would have said no. Um, but unfortunately, uh, three weeks later, we've heard some reports uh, that it is possible to get reinfected from, from SARS-CoV-2. And the reason why, we, uh, why this is possible is that it depends on the amount, how, how, how much virus you were exposed to in your first infection. And if you had a very mild disease, with a mild, uh, a mild amount of virus that you've inhaled, you might have a very mild symptoms, which means that your immune response would not, would not have been as strong as if you had had a very um, a, a moderate or severe disease with lots, of viral, with lots of viral particles. So um, if, you, if your immune system um, responds in a much more muted or, or, um, or, or low response to the virus, it is possible that your immune response will wane over time and it won't, it won't last. And then if you get exposed again to a high um, amount of viruses, it's possible that you could get infected again. So you've heard about two cases of people at a global level who've got reinfected. And this is two cases out of more than 27 million. And there has been a case in South Africa which hasn't been um, um, verified, but a woman in KwaZulu-Natal also uh, reported that she had got, she got an infection in March and then got reinfected um, um, a few weeks ago. So we do think that it is possible, um, albeit we think it's probably rare um, in comparison to the amount of um, people who've, who've been exposed. 
we do know that you get quite a good immune response and that there are long lasting um, immune uh, functions, uh, what, with what we call memory T cells and some innate responses that may help protect you um, and give you long lasting immunity. But this long lasting immunity may not be lifelong and may not be durable. So that's a really good question. Thanks, Professor. Um, I think we now have a better, broader understanding of what the coronavirus is and what the impacts are if you test positive. So we now want to know a bit more about your specific and particular involvement with our country's response to the pandemic. And we've got for question three, starting us off, is Sonwabo. Um, professor, you have been advising the president as part of the coronavirus task force. What have the lessons been of this pandemic? And how will you make sure that if something like this happens again in the future, we have improved and that every child in South Africa has the same opportunities for a healthy future? That's a wonderful question. And Sonwaba, um, this is a very new um, uh, ep epidemic. So we knew nothing about this virus in, in December last year when it started to uh, appear in China. And it was called um, a pneumonia of unknown origin. And, it, in, and this, this pneumonia got worse and worse and it spread in, in Wuhan, China. And only in, in January, you know, what, did it, was, it, was the virus identified. And in early February, the, the virus was given a name and it was given the name SARS-CoV-2. And so we know very little um, about this, this virus. Um, it, it first came, we first identified our first case on the 5th of March in South Africa. And we're learning all the time. And because we're learning all the time and because this is a new virus that we're trying to understand, um, some of the things um, that we thought uh, were true are found not to be true, like the question around reinfection, uh, like the issues around how is it transmitted. And so, so what we have to always understand with this epidemic is that uh, we can be wrong sometimes. And, um, and because we're learning all the time, it's important to to, to let the, the world know um, when we are wrong, and also to let the world know when we learn about new things about the virus. And we have to do this because we also have to understand how this virus affects children. And so up until now, um, children have been largely unaffected, um, but we have to keep on watching because we don't know how the, how, how the epidemic will unfold, particularly as you get second and third surges. And so it's important for us to, to keep to monitor um, how, how this virus affects uh, women, um, pregnant women and, and young children. So it's a very good question and we have to keep on looking and make sure that when we do um, know, learn more or, we, or when we know something is not true anymore, is to, to let everybody know about it. Thanks, Professor. And you mentioned that um, children and having children involved in the, uh, in the consideration for the future. So that links into our next question, question number four, that is going to be put to you by Malika. Professor, were the children and the youth, or rather the future leaders, that, as we are described by many people, taken into consideration with all decisions made around the pandemic as well as the lockdown? even though we might have been taken into consideration in a way, but has the youth or decision makers perhaps engaged with younger people in South Africa to find out how they feel about the lockdown and how it affects us? That's a very important question. And often, even though children are a very important part of our society, often they are neglected and we don't listen to them and, we, and that we don't give them enough voice or enough airtime to talk about their concerns. Sometimes adults speak on behalf of children, parents speak on behalf of children, and teachers speak on behalf of children. And um, often we don't, we forget that children have their own voice and have their own right to speak about their fears and about their, their sadness about this, this, this epidemic. And so uh, hopefully this Red Cross Radio um, is the first step for stakeholder engagement in children and um, although we, um, we don't directly uh, uh, engage with children, you're making a very important point. And one of the lessons learned, you know, it's August now, um, it's September now, and we have to say um, to the country, um, uh, you know, we need to hear more about how children feel. Children have, have to go back to school. Um, some children are sick. Um, they may be scared. They may have lost their parents. And we need to try and understand um, how they feel. 
So I think you raise a very important point. And if I was you, I would suggest you write a, a letter to the Ministerial Advisory Committee and say that you've spoken to, to Professor Glenda Gray and she has suggested um, that it's time that children had a voice and um, had a right to hear, to, to listen and to ask questions and to, and to, and to be part of the decision making around their, their future. So um, it's very important that you've raised this point and now that you've raised it, it's our job to make sure that we implement your suggestions because it's very important. Children are very important. You are our future leaders and um, we have to groom you and, and, and get you to learn your voice so that um, you are able to take over um, um, when, you, when you become um, adults. Thanks, Professor. Uh, I see we're now also live streaming on YouTube, and I'm sure that that will be available through our social network sites. Again, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Oryx Radio SA. That can be found. Um, but now, c c continuing with the discussion around children, we'll get back to that in a little bit. But we're now going to have a look at the different issues that have been raised in general over the past few weeks as South Africa has moved from uh, level five down to level two, and the number of cases have also been, the number of new cases have begun to decline. And it seems that as a country, with our response, we have begun to move in the right direction. So we've got some questions around this. And um, Osama is going to start us off with question number five relating to this. Hi, Professor. We are number five in the world in terms of cases, and people are worried that the number of cases might increase, and there are not enough testing being done. Why have we got into level two? So that's a very great question. So I think at the beginning of the epidemic, there was a global shortage, a worldwide shortage of tests. And so all the countries were competing to try and get the materials to test. And, um, and when we went to level five lockdown, that meant that we, we also closed down our international airports, which impacted on our ability to bring the tests in. So during, the, during lockdown, we, 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 um, we slowly increased our ability to test. And in South Africa, we now have the the largest testing program in Africa, but still that is not enough. So we need to continue to test. Um, it's very hard to use tests as an indication of how bad or how, how good your epidemic is. So testing just gives us a, a, a small um, flavor of the epidemic in our country. And we have to use other, other ways of trying to understand how our epidemic is unfolding. And um, we can do tests uh, where we can test uh, members of the community called seroprevalence surveys, where we can look for the presence of, of antibodies to see if you've been exposed before. So that's one way of looking at how the epidemic has, has progressed, looking at how many people get admitted to hospital, looking at how many people die, um, are an important indicator of, of the epidemic. And so South Africa did um, have a rapid increase in infections. And we remember, I think all of us remember, in June and July, how, how horrible it was. Uh, when all the hospitals were full and we were hearing that we were running out of oxygen um, but luckily at this moment in time we've over the peak and uh, we now are what i would call an endemic phase of the epidemic and this is where the 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 the, um, the, the community transmission continues and um, we continue to have we, we can't eradicate the virus but we continue to have onward um, infections and um, how how bad the epidemic gets now after our peak depends upon us. So if we continue to to have um, to use um, masks, wash our hands, and and keep our distance from people, if we continue to have well ventilated areas, we complete, if we continue to avoid congestion and crowds, we can prevent um, another another surge, and we can we can prevent um, our epidemic getting out of control in South Africa. Uh, Professor, I also have another follow-up question. What influences does the numbers have on justifying us moving into level two? Are there any other things that you have taken into account? Of? So we have to take a lot of things into account. So bef besides the testing, we also have to think of other ways of testing. Um, so at this moment in time, uh, because we had a shortage of tests and because we had a surge, we could only t test healthcare workers and people who were symptomatic were in hospital. Um, so we had to share, we had to save our tests for them. And um, the other ways we can we can manage our, our um, the epidemic is to look at other 
other ways of seeing where the epidemic is going. And so, so there is research being done on whether we can use wastewater or sewage systems to look for the presence of virus in there to predict new outbreaks. Um, we also now in South Africa have to move to a different testing strategy where we can um, make sure um, we start to test more members of the community, uh, maybe test children at school, test teachers and other people to see how the epidemic is evolving in those areas of society. Thanks, Professor. Uh, one of the things to do with tests has been one of the issues raised is uh, exactly who is able to be tested and who can be tested. So Malika has a question with this with question number six. Professor, it was reported that any persons under the age of 55 would not be tested unless they have an underlying illness. So my question is, why were the youth or particularly students in high schools as we were the first group to return back to school not tested we are the future leaders and we will be taking over from you guys one day so surely we should be protected at all costs and would the lack of testing not would the lack of testing provide us with accurate figures about our statistics in south africa so that's a very good question and it gives us leads us to the question about why do we test so, um, so the first reason why we test is to manage ill people. And so we know a large amount of people um, will be asymptomatic with this, with this um, disease, or you might not even know. And the people who are over 55 are more likely to be symptomatic and maybe more likely to need hospital or other care. And so when we had very, a very little uh, amount of te tests and we had to rationalize our testing, we had to say, um, who, are the, who are the people that need the test more? And the people that needed the test more or the people that needed to go into hospital or may have an adverse outcome um, um, from the disease. They may, may be old, they may have hypertension, diabetes, um, HIV or TB. And so those are the people we needed to know who was um, SARS-CoV positive. And um, we also needed to know um, for our healthcare workers who were positive because we couldn't allow healthcare workers who were who, who had SARS-CoV to, to continue to, to, to um, render care in the hospital. And so, so when there was a shortage of, of tests, we had to rationalize the test and we had to um, test people um, who would have the, the worst outcome from the infection and also test healthcare workers because we couldn't allow infectious healthcare workers to carry on um, uh, working in hospitals and, and clinics. And so that's why we chose uh, people over 55 because we knew those were the people that um, we needed to manage and who may need to go to hospital. Um, we, we, we didn't rationalize testing for children at school or for young people because even if they had a symptomatic uh, disease, they were less likely to get very ill or be symptomatic from it. And also from um, international data, we also knew that younger school children um, were less likely to spread the virus as compared to older teenagers and, and young adults. And so um, the importance of testing um, um, at that stage was to manage people who were sick and to manage healthcare workers. As you move into different phases of the epidemic, you can start doing other kinds of testing. And, um, and depending on what your, uh, your strategy is, you will, you will then um, uh, decide who to test. And so we didn't test children. Um, and, uh, and young adults because we knew that um, it was very unlikely that, that these young, young children or adults or teenagers uh, would do badly uh, from the infection. Um, at, another, at, another stage of the infection uh, at another stage of the epidemic, it may be important to know uh, which young children, adults and um, teenagers have, have um, the virus because um, you can help then prevent the onward uh, propagation of it. Um, to, to test young people um, would also have maybe been problematic. We know that um, um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 infection stigmatizes people. Um, I know some people who, who got infected um, in June or July this year, and they're still stigmatized. Um, they're, when, when they're, they're still stigmatized at, at, at school and they're still stigmatized um, at their workplace. And so we also have to make sure that if we do um, testing, the testing doesn't lead to, to stigmatization, discrimination, um, or, or anything that 
impairs your ability to learn um, and um, and to be able to 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 contribute in a meaningful way in society. So that's very important. So so knowing your status um, would be helpful because it'll help you prevent the onward uh, transmission of the virus. But um, also at the same time, if, when there's a shortage of tests, uh, one then chooses to test those people who will benefit the most at that stage of the epidemic from the test. Thanks, Professor. Uh, thank you so much for that. We've got an, something to tie in then now a bit to that stigmatization is Zunwabu's question here, which is question number seven. Professor, with the pandemic, many people are afraid of going to the hospital. They are worried that the risk, the, sorry, um, with the pandemic, many people are afraid of going to the hospital. They are worried that the hospitals might be too busy or that the resources are focused on COVID-19. Will they be treated differently because of the COVID-19 pandemic? Yes, yeah, so what you say is true. When, when the COVID-19 epidemic broke out in South Africa, a lot of the health services were reorientated to, to support um, people who were COVID infected and who needed care. And um, people then became scared to go to the hospitals. They became scared because they thought if they went to the hospitals, they would get COVID-19. And so what we did see was that moms were too scared to take their children to get vaccinated. We also saw that pregnant women were also too scared to go and get antenatal care because they were scared they were going to get COVID-19. And we also saw people who needed chronic um, medication, so people who needed um, medicines for diabetes, hypertension, HIV and TB, they didn't go to the hospitals because they were scared. So in the future, um, in, if we have a, another pandemic again, um, we have to make sure that our health system um, is, is resourceful enough or resilient enough um, to manage both COVID-19 or the new virus, as well as making sure that the current health system is maintained and that um, we don't deprive other people uh, from getting their care because everyone is scared of getting COVID in the hospital. But at the same time, we also have to make sure that our hospitals um, are fit to, to manage COVID-19 and that we have all the resources like oxygen and nursing care to make sure that people who have got COVID um, get the right care. And more importantly, also, we have to make sure that we don't discriminate people in the hospitals and um, who are COVID positive and we treat them um, as humanely as possible because we do know that sometimes people are ostracized um, if they have COVID-19. Thanks, Professor. Uh, following on these concerns that have been voiced, we do know that a lot of issues are raised from baseless information, misconceptions, or simply fake facts. So we've got some questions surrounding this, and Tariq has a question for you with question number eight. Thank you, Alex. So, Professor, um, during the outbreak of this pandemic, we have been given a lot of advice, and this has either been spread by a word of mouth or through different media platforms and social media platforms. And at many times, this advice that we have been given tends to contradict one another because some of them can be good advice that is quite useful, and some of them can be advice that tends to make the situation worse. So, as you said earlier, the wearing of face masks, um, sanitizing our hands, but then we were also told that the virus can be spread through saliva droplets in the air and that the virus is airborne. And at some ridiculous point, I don't know who came up with this, but we were told that we had to drink bleach to cure the virus. And for those that have been infected, we were told that the facilities that are meant to contain these people with COVID-19 um, were full and could not um, withhold more people with COVID-19. So my question is, how do we identify what is real news that we should actually consider and what is fake news and how do we go about stopping the spread of incorrect information? Yeah, so that's very important, the difference between fake news and information that changes over time. So yes, it is true that in the beginning, as I said, this epidemic is, is, is very young. It's only been with us since um, December last year and so we're learning all the time. And so the issue of how, how the virus is spread uh, became evident when we started to see um, cases of COVID-19 being infected, people being infected in, in, in um, closed areas, um, people being infected from uh, singing, 
and people being infected in restaurants when there was um, movements of air and began to see that this could also be uh, spread not only via droplet but also by airborne transmission. And that was a very important um, uh, uh, scientific finding because it helped us understand the importance of ventilation and to make sure that we started to avoid, it, avoid crowded conditions and congestion and to limit our, our, our interaction with people um, because of the, the issue of airborne transmission. And so as science understands um, the, the virus more, and as we gather more data about how transmission occurs, new information will arise, um, which uh, may either replace the current information or, or, or disprove um, the, the current information, much like we heard about the reinfection, um, that we didn't think people could get reinfected, and in fact, um, we've been proven wrong uh, with this. And now we will have to understand um, the immune response and the immune system. And so there are things that, that are, are logical, uh, like airborne transmission and droplet transmission, but there are things that um, are not logical, like drinking bleach. And we all know that if you drink bleach, um, you can get very sick and you can die. And so we also have to um, trust our own instincts about things. You know, some things, you know, are, just sound crazy. And um, we know that, 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 that is false. You know, that would harm us if we had to drink um, uh, weird concoctions uh, to, to protect us. But things like this, that, about, about things like the immune system and um, um, will, affect, will, will change and will, we'll learn new things all the time. Um, we also have to be careful about uh, claims. You know, we have heard claims from, even from uh, Donald Trump about um, medicines that work. So even people, even presidents uh, can spread uh, fake news. And so we have to be careful um, about key opinion leaders saying things, um, particularly when they're not scientists. And, and we have to always make sure that um, science um, is protected. So we can't have presidents of countries saying, oh, we're going to um, uh, uh, rush to um, uh, register this drug or rush to make this vaccine available um, without the right data, because we have to, first of all, do no harm um, and make sure that whatever we put into people is safe and that the, the information we get is reliable and reproducible. So that's a very important thing. And I guess with an epidemic like this, there's always going to be a lot of hype and a lot of hysteria. And, um, and you know, we have to try and distill um, fact from fiction. And I think the important thing about fake news is to continue to see what, um, if it's verifiable. So very quickly when fake news comes out, um, we do, we do um, see people uh, talking about uh, this is wrong or this is right or we agree or we disagree and um, then always then to look for the science. So, um, and, and to look, rather look at the science, rather look at the data um, before we make conclusions about certain things. So it's a very important thing. And there will be lots of conspiracy theories. I've heard conspiracy theories as well um, as lots of um, claims for, um, for cure um, that are, are incorrect. Thanks, Professor. Um, and now moving on, I think, to the thing that sets this webinar apart today is that it's being hosted by children, specifically children who have conditions or are at least familiar with healthcare and being in hospital through RX Radio. So we're going to go through some children, uh, sorry, we're going to go through some questions relating to children. Specifically, uh, we'll also involve some of the children with giving their opinions and voices, and Talita will be helping me with that. So we're going to start with Amina and the first question, number nine in this section. Professor, many of us children with and without health conditions have been at home for the past five months and we have lost a lot of education and making us feel, this made us feel worried and anxious about our education and the future. A lot of people talk about virtual education, but we have, the, some of us don't have the money for the data and some of us don't even have internet. Some people, I'm not being new, but in poor conditions don't have the necessary caregivers that have the skills to homeschool them. But we do all, we all have the right to education. What do you think should be done to help this and help the children solve this problem? Yeah, you're so right. Um, it, children have had so much collateral damage uh, from this epidemic. So 
although you may not, although you've been spared from the disease largely, um, you've been um, out of school um, and you've also been have, having to stay at home and you also have um, uh, been affected by not having enough nutrition and um, by your family and uh, your family members losing employment and making um, households much poorer. And uh, the poorer households become, um, the more it affects children. So children really have borne the brunt um, of this epidemic. And they've borne the brunt of this epidemic both in South Africa, um, in America, and in Europe, and in, in Asia. So wherever you are in the world, uh, children have been severely affected by this. And particularly their schooling has been affected. And a lot of children um, all over the world have not gone to school for months on end and have not had access to internet and uh, remote learning. And I think maybe the lesson for us um, uh, going forward is to pay attention to issues of um, innovation, um, the fourth industrial revolution, um, uh, bandwidth, connectivity. We all live um, in, in um, you know, we all have a, the right wherever we are in the world to have access to the best data, which should be free and available to everybody. And um, the questions we should be asking is, is, is how do we innovate uh, to make sure that education continues even in a disaster and that wherever we are in the world, children have the right to the best education. Um, first of all, hopefully face to face and if not face to face in ways um, that maximize your learning we know a lot of children got depressed uh, during this lockdown. They were very sad. A lot of children feel they're going to die and they have, they have nightmares about this. And so we haven't paid a lot of attention to the mental health um, and the education um, context of, of the child. And, um, and that, is, that is very bad. And it's very important uh, for children to point out to us, there were surveys done in South Africa that showed um, that children were um, not getting enough meals, um, that children were, were getting depressed, and that children were going hungry, and that they were not getting the, the proper education. And so we have to make sure in, in the post-epidemic uh, um, world that we live in, particularly in South Africa, is that we, we make our, our schooling more resilient, and we make a better effort to protect our children and our families and prevent them um, from being the most vulnerable part of the epidemic. And so the important lesson for us is to learn um, from this, you know, learn why, um, uh, you know, we were unable to open up schools fast, learn why, um, what we have to do to improve connectivity for, for poor kids, um, learn how to improve systems to get food to people, and learn, to, and learn how to improve our, our way of supporting families um, who need money in, in terms of social, um, bond, social grants and um, the COVID social grants. And so we, ha we um, have a lot of work to do and there has to be a lot of improvement and you, you have to hold us to it. You know, you, after this epidemic is gone, you know, you need to hold South Africa um, and adults in South Africa to making sure uh, that we protect um, all parts of being a child and that's what the part of a child to learn the part of the child to feel safe in their home and the part of the child are uh, not to go hungry and so you need to make sure that uh, we deliver on that um, in the post-covid uh, world that we have thanks professor we're now going to i'm going to ask talita if she can just ask a couple of the reporters to share um, how they felt during the pandemic so over to you talita so, um, Nirinisha, I want to ask, um, because of the COVID, how did you feel that you are not allowed to go to school anymore and you'll be at home doing the same thing, um, that's eat, sleep, do whatever, and sleep again? So, um, how was your experience and how did you keep yourself busy? I kept myself busy. I didn't mind. protected my teacher said for school, I did not read books, I played on my phone, I watched movies, and I talked to my sister. Great, thank you for that. 
Thanks, guys. Um, so I think question number 10 that we did have what has been kind of answered by the professor already. And just seeing as we've got about 15 minutes left, we're going to move on to question number 11. So we'll stay with you, Nuru. You can ask uh, question number 11. You were talking about how you've been at home and been doing your schoolwork at home. I also know that you've been missing your friends. So um, you can put that question forward. But you're talking so softly, I can't hear you. Uh, maybe I'm getting old and deaf. <laughs> I know all the golden rules and that we have to physically distance. But I have been missing my friends. When I go to school, will I be able to, be able to play with them? So that's a very good question. Okay, and so when you go back to school, the first thing you will do is you'll be wearing a mask. And you'll be washing your hands very often and you'll be, your desks will be more than one meters apart from your, from your other, other desk, from one meter to 1.5 meters. And when you go outside, um, you, um, you, you will be able to, to play with your, with your friends, but you, you won't be able to, to, to make close contact with them. So you need to still keep your distance, make sure that you, that you play in wide open spaces and make sure that you, you don't, um, um, make close contact and so you can play sports but sports that don't have um, close contact uh, if you like skipping you can still skip with your friends um, if you like playing soccer um, you can play soccer with your friends as long as there's not contact and you wash the ball afterwards and the most important thing always to remember is to after playing is to wash um, the balls that you're playing with and to wash your hands um, and make sure that you you do try and keep um, space um, people who, who spend a lot of time together, close contacts, more than 15 minutes, uh, should not be uh, too close. And you must remember to, to try and keep your distance, which means you're going to have to learn how to scream so we can hear you um, through your masks. And um, you're going to have to learn um, how to, to use your face, use your hands much more, because often uh, we use our mouth a lot to express things. And so that can be very hard for children who are deaf. Um, and so maybe shields is important uh, for some children who have special needs because they, may, they need to see your facial expressions. Um, but remember that shields have to be right over your face, uh, cover your chin if you use them a lot. Thanks, Professor. And uh, we're going to stick with the theme of talking about um, children and looking a bit more now at the emotional side of it. And Blessed is going to ask us, Question number 12, uh, which has to do with this. Is there any plan for children who have lost their parents or caregivers to COVID 19? Okay, so for those who never heard what Blessed said, Blessed asks um, for those um, parents um, and caregivers who died uh, from COVID, you know, what is going to happen to the families? Is there going to be any support? Um, and he's he's um, and is very concerned about um, the lack of support uh, for 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 families. So that's a that's a very important question. And I think our, the first thing we have to do is try and understand um, how many families like this um, are affected. Um, and first of all, it's important to know how many families are affected like this, and what is the composition of the family and um, what are the support structures um, of the family. And then um, depending on um, how desperate um, the family is, you know, whether it's just children left, um, we have to get uh, um, social, social workers involved and psychological and mental health services involved to try and first of all, stabilize the family from a, 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 a mental health point of view. And then from a, a financial support view, we're gonna have to make sure um, that families access um, um, relief grants and COVID grants, and also that the children in households are on um, on child on 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 on, on child grants. And so um, it's very important if there are any families uh, that find themselves devastated um, by the deaths of their of their loved ones, is to is to come uh, uh, forward so that uh, the social services and um, the health department can support these families and make sure that they are protected. So that's a very important question. And um, they may, people may not know how to reach out, but it's very important that whoever 
um, is in this situation, finds themselves desperate uh, from um, the death of their loved ones is that they contact um, uh, the, the social services department to get support and relief. That's very important. Even um, NGOs, Gift of the Givers, um, and other NGOs, if any of, if any of you know um, um, NGOs in your area and you know families, it's important that um, the families um, are connected to, to NGOs that can help them. And um, one of the best NGOs is Gift of the Givers, and um, they, they can also help facilitate that. In Cape Town, um, MSF can help. And so any, any, any NGO will be important in trying to make sure that these families are supported and are helped to, to navigate access to resources. So a very important question. Thank you, Professor. We've got just under 10 minutes to go, so we're going to move to our last couple of questions. And with these, uh, we want to look at the broader impacts of the virus as well as the future. And so I'm going to start us off with Talita for question so number four. Sorry. So, Prof, we know that you've been working with vaccines and many other countries are doing the same. But why is it so difficult to develop a vaccine? And once this vaccine is developed, would everyone across the country have access to it, especially those who don't have access to quality health care? So that's a very important question. And Talita, you also obviously are um, listening to the news because there's lots of, dis lots of discussion on this at a global level. Everybody's asking this question because of vaccine nationalism. So why does it take so long to find a vaccine? So normally under non-disaster uh, pandemic situations, it can take up to 10 years to, to find a vaccine. So first of all, you have to develop your vaccine platform, you have to test it in animals to make sure it's safe. Then you have to have a, um, a, an animal model to prove that it can protect um, against infection. And then you start to do your, your trials in, in, um, in, in humans, in, in, in adults first, and you, you make sure that you understand the dose, how safe the, the vaccine is and what the immune response is. And that can take 10 years because um, pharmaceutical companies don't want to waste any money um, in case the vaccine doesn't work. And so in, a, in an epidemic or in a pandemic or in a disaster, you have to take 10 years and put it into 10 months to, to find that vaccine. So luckily for us, um, we, we know the structure of, of coronavirus and we know that the spike protein is a very important part of the the, the, the virus that we can use as a um, immunogen to make an immune response to. And luckily for us, um, we have lots of vaccine platforms that we've been using for to make HIV vaccines, to make Ebola vaccines, to make Zika vaccines. And we've used these platforms and we've put these new um, uh, antigens in from the coronavirus um, and put them in. So we have a lot of information on the safety um, of these vaccines and putting in a new antigen um, or immunogen from the virus um, helps us understand whether the, the virus, whether the vaccine platform will give us a good immune response. And so we've, we've accelerated vaccine development based on the fact that we do know a little bit, a, a, a little bit to a lot about the platforms that we're going to be using. And we've been doing a lot of the vaccine trials in parallel um, together so that we don't have to wait um, and do them sequentially. And so there is about, there, there, be, there are about four big trials that are happening at the moment. And we hope that these trials will, um, will have a signal um, early next year, but then still we need more data to make sure that um, we know how long these vaccines last for, how long the immune response is. And so we hope to have a vaccine um, to be registered um, uh, towards the middle, to end of next year. Who should get it? And that's a wonderful question. And um, you know, so I think the first people that should get it um, are the old and vulnerable. So those people who are more likely to die or get very sick from the virus should get the vaccine first. The next group of people who I think should get the vaccine will first are the essential services. So those nurses and doctors and porters and lab people and all those people who have to interface with the public all the time, particularly who have to take care of them, they should get it. I think teachers, taxi drivers, um, and uh, people who work in home affairs and everybody who interfaces with the public all the time uh, should get it. I think that um, um, hopefully there'll be enough for all of us to get it. 
but I would you obviously want to start off uh, step by step and then eventually um, everybody can get it but if you only you know in, in the first instance you have to give it out to the most vulnerable and the elderly first and you know and the people who are going to benefit the most from a vaccine and then eventually um, you know we also need data on children and so obviously they, children um, need to get the vaccine but first of all we need to make sure that it's safe in children and so um, we will have to start doing studies um, in children and we're already starting to talk about that um, starting to say okay how would a, a study look like in children and when should we start doing those studies so a lot of people say we should only start doing studies in children um, once we know it works in adults and um, we'll know it works in adults hopefully early next year and then we can start looking at, um, at how it works in, in, in children a lot of people say well what about pregnant women and then we have to make sure that it's safe in pregnant women and in women who breastfeed and um, and 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 uh, and people that are, are more vulnerable, we also want to make sure that it's safe in and works well in HIV infected people and people with other um, infections. Um, the important thing about this vaccine, um, we need to know that it works with people who have chronic diseases, so people with hypertension, um, diabetes. We want to make sure it works well in in everybody, so that um, um, it's safe to to roll out and effective as well. So that's a good question and um, hopefully all these vaccines are going to work because uh, if all these vaccines are going to work that means we can a lot of people will make billions of doses and if many if more than one vaccine works um, hopefully it'll also be cheaper because if five vaccines work then um, then there are five people that um, you know that you can negotiate prices with so it's my dream that all the vaccines that we that are being are being worked on at this moment will be successful Thanks, Professor. Um, I think we've got time for just about two more questions, so we'll try and get to them quickly uh, for Amira and Nasira, who both haven't asked a question yet. So uh, going with Amira first with question number 16. So with the lockdown, Professor, women and children could be trapped in difficult situations with their abusers. They were unable to leave their homes, buy airtime, get money or tools to call for help and etc. How can, how can we help women and children raise their voice during this pandemic? Yes, it's true. Um, we know that uh, gender-based violence and violence against children um, is um, an, an important uh, uh, thing that happens in our country and happens amongst our women. And um, we did see um, an increase in gender-based violence and violence against children. And this obviously um, we need to deal with um, in many ways and so we have to change the way society thinks about women and how society values children and we need to make sure that um, we have different um, uh, mechanisms to protect women and children and so again um, we need to work a lot more um, in interventions and delivering interventions to protect women and children and it is true that uh, women were vulnerable and children were vulnerable and that um, some some women and children um, had had terrible um, uh, um, had had terrible um, experiences during lockdown. You know, lockdown caused a lot of anxiety. People lost their money. Um, you know, families were hungry, and and it increased stress in the household. And when you have increased stress in the household, often that is accompanied by violence, particularly if people are also abusing alcohol. And so we need to do a lot more work in this country on that. And certainly not enough work is being done and we need to concentrate on that in the post-pandemic uh, 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 South Africa. Thanks, Professor. And then finally, Nasira with the last question. Many of us children and youth in South Africa feel that because of the pandemic, we are going to be perceived as a lost generation and not able to get jobs. How then can the future for me and the rest of South Africa's children be secure? So that's a beautiful question and I think you need to, Wayne, we need to get it to, we, to, Alex, we need to get it to repeat it again because I think everybody needs to hear what she said. So I think, can you just help it? Because I think we mustn't lose this beautiful question. Many of us children, many of us children and youth in South Africa feel that because of the pandemic, we are going to be 
to see as a lost generation and not able to get jobs. How then can the future for me and the rest of South Africa's children be secure? Okay, so I think you heard that um, and it's very important uh, that we don't want any child to be part of a lost generation. And we don't want any child to lose out um, of their education or on the opportunities for the future because of COVID-19. And it's our job as South Africans, and it's our job as society, and it's our job as children and children advocates to make sure that no child loses his or her future uh, because of COVID-19. And we have to make sure as South Africans that no child um, is lost is a lost generation because of this. So we're gonna to have to catch up school and we're gonna to have to make sure that children uh, get food, get their food parcels, and we're gonna to have to make sure that we concentrate on making sure that no child is left behind uh, because of COVID-19. And we all have to promise that as South Africans. And so thank you for that important question and make it helps us, and it must be our mantra um, going forward that um, there is say no to a lost generation and say no to letting any child be left behind because of COVID-19. Well everyone and Professor Gray thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, the hours flown by it's been an incredible hour learning about um, all the different impacts that COVID-19 has had and how the government uh, response has, has panned out. So on behalf of RX Radio and also Citizens in Solidarity Behavioral Change Campaign, thank you to everyone who's joined us and watched. Um, if you want to join the conversation, please remember on social media, Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at RX Radio SA is where you can find us. And please use the hashtags Children's Voices hashtag Oryx Radio and hashtag Solidarity. This has also been streamed live on YouTube. Uh, so if you wanna go back, wanna watch any parts, you'll be able to do that. And again, you can check through our social media platforms for those links. So thank you so much everybody uh, for joining us and thanks to all the reporters for being on. And Professor, thank you so much for joining us today to answer all the questions. Thank you.